In my previous video, I took a look at these Quinetic wireless switches. And what's really cool with these is that these switches don't contain any sort of battery or require any sort of main supply. Instead, they use a kinetic energy drainage by clicking the switch to send a radio signal to a receiver, and that receiver can control the lights. So they're really good, because you can install them anywhere, you don't need a main supply, and you also need to change batteries so it's completely maintenance free once it's installed. And it's been working really well. However, the downside of this system is that these don't use any sort of standardised radio protocol, and it only really works with the Quinetic receivers. So you can obviously use their receivers, which are either available as dimmers or relay modules. However, that's not really suitable for a lot of my smart home system, because in my living room and bedroom, I use smart bulbs. And I kind of need to use smart bulbs rather than an external receiver, because I want to be able to adjust the colour temperature and the colours of the bulbs, which wouldn't be possible with a Quinetic receiver. Now, Quinetic do sell a sort of network gateway hub thing. However, it's one of those two your smart life platform device things, so I don't really want to go down that route. With my smart home system, I like to have everything fully locally hosted without relying on external cloud services. So in this video, what we'll be doing is taking these Quinetic switches, reverse engineering the radio protocol from them, and building a little receiver that can receive signals from these and bridge it into my smart home system over MQTT. And that's what I've got here. So I have already done a lot of the work here and I have got a basic prototype working. It would have been fun to try and do this on camera, but I have spent many evenings trying to figure this out and it would be a ridiculously long video to just to try and actually demonstrate this. And because I didn't really know what I was doing as I went along, it would have been really hard to make a video on. So instead, I've got a prototype here that's working. So what we'll do is we'll take a look at this, take a look at it working, and then what I'll do is I'll go in and show a bit of how I was able to figure this out. There was also a couple of resources that I found very useful that I've linked in the description. There was one person who was doing basically the same thing, although they were using a different radio module, so the code wasn't directly comparable. And someone else who was using an SDR and the RTL433 software to do the same thing, but using a, using a software-defined radio. And we'll talk about that approach, but why I didn't go down that route and why I built a custom receiver instead. But yeah, first of all, what we'll do is we'll take a look at what I've built here and take a look at it working, and then we'll dig into how we reverse engineer radio protocols. So first of all, let's talk about these switches. Now throughout this video, I'll probably end up using the terms kinetic and quinetic interchangeably. Quinetic is a brand, so that's the, a brand from TLC Electrical, I think it's their own brand of this sort of range of products. Kinetic switches are this kind of entire class of device, so you can get these from lots of different brands. These Quinetic ones, they are available, you can get very similar ones from other brands that look identical, so I think NRJ is one of those. But the reason I use these Quinetic ones is that they do these MK grid modules that I can fit into my existing MK light switch faceplates, so they match all my other light switches, which are really good. Now, obviously with this video, I've only tested these Quinetic switches, and in particular, I've only tested these MK modules and this single paddle switch. So what I do here may be different for different brands, and the code that I've written that's on this that I will be linking in the description may only work with these, or it may work with other brands, I'm not sure. However, as I've alluded to, these switches all work using kinetic energy. So when you click the switch down, that generates a small amount of electricity that can power up a transmitter to send a signal out, and then the transmitter runs out of power and stops transmitting. And they work really well. However, because of the fact that they're just rel relying on a tiny little bit of power, they can't really use standardised protocols. They're not able to connect to Wi-Fi or use things like Zigbee that require a much more power-hungry and a much more long-running long connection process. Instead, these use a proprietary radio protocol that runs at 433 MHz. And in particular, this is an FSK signal, or frequency shift keying. The way FSK signals work is that you have a, cent a centre carrier frequency, round about 433 MHz, and then the frequency shifts up and down to represent ones and zeros. The alternative to this is amplitude shift keying, or ASK. That means that you have a center carrier frequency and the frequency stays the same, but the amplitude, or like almost the power, or volume almost, of that signal increases and decreases to represent the ones and zeros. So as I mentioned, these are FSK devices. Now, if when I said 433 megahertz and I'm building my own receiver, you immediately started commenting, why don't you buy one of those Sonoff or any other brands of Tasmota flashable 433 MHz RF receivers, those will not work because it looks like those only support ASK. And I've seen people saying, oh, I'm trying to connect my kinetic switches to that and it just won't see a signal. And while the Sonoff documentation is quite vague, if you look at the hardware on it, it has a chip that is an ASK receiver, not an FSK receiver. 
And I suspect it's because ASK is much easier to receive, it's much simpler. And it's what a lot of the very cheap key fob type remotes will use. So yeah, this is frequency shift keying, not amplitude shift keying. So we can't use any of the sort of standard off-the-shelf Quinetic or um, Sonoff type hubs running Tasmota. We need to do something a bit more custom. So that's what we have here. So for this, we obviously need a receiver that can receive 433 MHz radio signals with an FSK encoding. And that's what I've got here. Now there's a lot of different ones on the market. This particular one I've gone, here, gone for here is based around a chip from Texas Instruments called a CC1101. You can just about see that chip there. Now, these are available from lots of different brands, so even though they all use the same Texas Instruments chip, although it may well be a clone chip, I don't know. It does say TI on it, but you never know with these things. They're available on lots of different carrier boards. So this particular board or module I've gone for, you can see the model number on the back there, is a E07M1101D. And this is from a brand called eBite, and I'll put a link in the description. However, there's a lot of different brands of these, so you can kind of go for basically whatever, one's, whatever one you want. And you also don't have to go for the CC1101, that's just the one I went for. There's a lot of different other brands of receiver that can work for, the, for this type of encoding and frequency. All you need is something that can support FSK and 433 MHz. And it's also important to bear in mind that this particular CC1101 isn't just a 433 MHz receiver, it can receive a lot of different frequencies. So when you buy a module, you need to make sure the module you buy is the 433 MHz module, which is what I've got here. However, on its own, this module isn't really that useful. Because while it is a radio receiver, it doesn't have any sort of microcontroller to control it. The interface on this is SPI, so it uses an SPI bus, as well as a couple of GPI opens to sort of signal interrupts. But you really need an external microcontroller to send some configuration parameters to this to set it up to receive signals. And you also need that microcontroller to receive signals. So that's what I've got here. So I've decided to go for a ESP8266, which is probably going to be surprising to no one when I'm building a sort of IoT MQTT based device. So the ESP8266 is the perfect device for this because you can write Arduino firmware for it, which is what I've done. They're relatively inexpensive, it can connect to MQTT, and it's got all the I.O. you need, including SPI and GPIO, that can be used to connect to this. You could also use this with really any other microcontroller, so you could use it as just any other Arduino. The only thing to bear in mind is that this is a 3.3 volt module, so you need a 3.3 volt microcontroller. Now here I'm using a Wemos D1 Mini, it's just literally because it's the only it's I had it spare, so I thought I may as well use it, but you could really use any sort of ESP microcontroller or any other 3.3 volt microcontroller. So yeah, that's it there. So what we have is all these wires going from the mod radio module onto the D1 Mini. These wires carry 3.3 volts, ground, there's then four wires for SPI, so you've got Mozzie, Miso, um, Slave Select, and what's the other one? The SPI clock. And then there's one more pin that's the GPIO pin that this triggers when it receives a message. So what you need to do is the Arduino sketch, which we'll take a look at, starts up, it sends a bunch of configuration parameters to this receiver to set its frequency, its all the parameters about FSK, all that kind of stuff. And then once that's configured, when it receives a radio signal, it sends a pulse down the GPIO pin, which triggers an interrupt on the ESP, and then it can read the actual radio data from the SPI bus. Now for this, I've used a library called Radiolib, and we'll take a look at this in much more detail later. But Radiolib is absolutely excellent because it massively abstracts the logic used to control this module. Without that, I'd have to go in and try and read all the data sheets and fully basically write my own custom driver to control this chip but Radiolib made it a lot easier. So if you are doing this and you can't get this particular module, I would definitely make sure you get one that is compatible with Radiolib. Finally, you'll see this random wire floating off it. We'll take a look at this later. Essentially, this is just to reset it. So it's just a GPIO pin that's floating. And if I connect this to ground, it will start it up in a sort of configuration mode that lets me change the Wi-Fi connection details. I'm using a different library called IoT WebCon for that. So that's currently hanging off here, but when I build it into an enclosure, I'll put a little button on it to reset it. So that's what that is there. So before we go and demonstrate it, we'll talk about one more thing, and that is transmitting instead of receiving. Now, this hardware is capable of transmitting as well as receiving. However, I've just decided not to implement that. The reason being is the protocol used by these kinetic switches. All that happens with the protocol is when you click a switch, it sends a press event and a release event. That's it. And that's all the receivers listen for, is press events and release events. 
there's no way, at least that I can find, to send a message to a receiver to explicitly say turn on or turn off. All you can really say to a receiver is toggle your current state. Now, there may be something hidden, something hidden in the protocol to allow you to do that, but it's not that I've been able to reverse engineer because all I've got is switches. So this means that even if I could transmit from this, it wouldn't really be that useful. Because if, say, I wanted to have a system where when I go, like, leave home, all the lights turn off, with my existing Zigbee smart bulbs, I can easily send a message saying turn off, and if the lights are on, they'll turn off, and if they're off, they'll stay off. All I could do with kinetic receivers, if this could transmit, would just say toggle your state. And if the lights were on, they'd turn off, and if the lights were off, they'd turn on. So I'd then need to try and manage state in my existing smart home system, and that would be really fiddly. So instead of that, I've opted to make this purely a receiver, and if in the future I wanted to make my hallway lights that use quinetic receivers currently be controllable from the smart home system, all I would do is take out those quinetic receivers and replace them with some sort of Wi-Fi or Zigbee-based dimmer modules, and then use this to receive the messages from the buttons and have the smart home system control the lights. So yeah, this is only a receiver. You could adapt it to transmit, but it's really not worth it if you're, if you're integrating this into an existing smart home system when you could use Wi-Fi or Zigbee-based dimmers. But yep, that's enough rambling about the hardware. So before we dig into far too much detail about radio protocols, what we'll quickly do is we'll power this up and take a look at it working just so you can actually see it does actually work. Okay, so let's take a look at this working. So we have the device connected up to my laptop currently. I'm doing this just so I can see the serial console output just because it's easier to see that than the MQTT output. But this is actually currently connected to Wi-Fi and connected to my MQTT broker. So the messages it's receiving from the kinetic switches are being bridged over to MQTT over Wi-Fi. All this is doing over USB is just getting power and also having a serial console. I could just as well plug this into a USB power supply and it would work just the same apart from lack of serial console. Then here I have a lamp and this is connected to my smart home system. So this has just a basic Zigbee smart bulb in it. So when I press the kinetic switch, the light will turn on. So first of all, we'll start our minicom so we can see the serial console. And if I press the switch that's connected into the smart home system, lamp will turn on, lamp will turn off. And this is the serial console output showing what it's receiving. So it's receiving the E4B8 is the code of this button. That's part of the message, we'll see that. That's like an ID to represent this button. And then it receives both press and release actions. So if I hold the button down, you'll see it receives a press. And if I let go, we get a release. So it has separate events. So if you wanted to dim, you could also do that. You could detect holds and different lengths of holds and all that sort of stuff or multiple clicks. It'd be very easy to do. And as you can see, that's controlling the lamp. Now you may be seeing a slight delay on the lamp here. You know, I press the button and it takes a little second for that to turn on. That's not actually a fault of this system. It's purely because the living room lights, which is where I've taken this lamp from, they're set up to dim on. So when I click the button, they dim on slowly. When I click the button again, they dim off slowly. This particular bulb here doesn't seem to support that, so it just has a slight delay until the rest of the lights are at 100% and then it comes on. So there's just a slight delay, but that's not a problem with this. It's just the way this particular lamp works. But, yep, you can see there. Kinetic switch, smart bulb. And it works. We can then look at a different switch. This is the paddle switch. And if I click this one, you'll see it won't control the lamp, but you'll see we get a different ID here, 2E0A. So that's a different ID because it's a different switch. And interestingly, if you look on the back of this, it has this little label, and you can see the start of that model, that number there, is 2E0A, which matches the ID I've received here. So yep, that module there, and then a, and then a different module here that controls the lamp. And this is now publishing to MQTT. So all I need to now do in Node-RED, which is what I use to sort of tie everything together with my smart home system, is just subscribe to the topic for the appropriate button that I want. So in the case of the living room, I subscribe to E4B8. In the case of if I want to receive this paddle switch, I subscribe to 2E0A, and I can handle the messages coming in. So what I'll now do is I'll dig into the code of, the, code of this, take a very quick look at it. I'm not going to go into too much detail. It's an absolute bodge. But then we'll talk, talk about how we actually reverse engineered the radio protocol to figure out how to do this. Because this does not look as, this is not as simple as it looks when I click a button and a light turns on. There's a lot of radio bodgery and code bodgery to make this work. So what we'll now do is we'll take a look at the code and look at how I reverse engineered this. So yes, I'm filming the laptop, hopefully you can make it out. It just makes it easier because then I can actually demonstrate, you can see the buttons alongside me actually looking at the code. Or especially more the radio stuff we'll take a look at in a minute. But this is the code I've written here, it's all Arduino code. 
it is not the best code, it is an absolute bodge, it was cobbled together very quickly, it's been a long time since I did Arduino stuff, so yes, don't judge it. But I have put the code on GitHub and there is a link in the description. It's very much not finished, there's basically no documentation apart from a few comments thrown throughout it. And there is some stuff missing, for example, it doesn't support connecting to MQTT servers that use usernames and passwords or SSL. But if you know a bit, a bit of Arduino type stuff, you could probably get this working. So very quickly flicking through the code, I'm not going to go into too much detail, I'm not really expecting this to be a tutorial at all. You can see there's various stuff here where we need to say set up the pins that the radio module is connected to. Uh, that's here. Um, this is IoT WebConf, it's just a library I'm using to provide a web interface to configure this device. Various other bits here we're not really going to go into. But if we come down here, obviously up here we initialize the radio module. Um, here where we basically say the pins it's connected to. This is using the radio lib library, you can see I'm including that here. And then if we come down to the setup function, you'll see we have a line radio.begin. And we pass in, pass, pass in a bunch of values, carrier frequency, bit rate, frequency deviation, and all these kind of things here. And these are all defined at the top. And these parameters are very important because these relate to the signal that comes out of these. So after a bit of investigation, I was able to determine that this, this has a carrier frequency of 433.3 megahertz, a bit rate of 100 kilobit, and a frequency deviation, which is basically when we talk about FSK, where the signal shifts up and down in frequency, depending to represent ones and zeros. On this particular device here, that frequency shift up, shifts up and down by 50 kilohertz. There's also the receive bandwidth output power preamble length. This is stuff I have to set. It doesn't really matter. Then the other thing we need to take a look at is here, where we talk about the sync word. And this is a, a part of the message that's received by the receiver that is the same for every transmission and every switch. It's almost like an identifier to sort of identify this as a, a signal from a quinetic switch, and it identifies the start of the signal. So we'll take a look at how we, how we found this out, but that is hard-coded in here, and that kind of applies to these switches. So what it's doing is it's constantly looking for any radio messages that come in that contain these two bytes, and if it receives that, it sends everything after those two bytes into my code, which processes it. So now down here we receive the message, we perform a CRC integrity check because the message actually does contain a CRC16 checksum. So we do that just to check the message is valid. And then we look at the message and we extract a switch ID, which is the first two bytes, and another bit which represents whether it's a press or release. And then afterwards, all we do is we then send that message over MQTT, which is done here. So that was a very quick run through the code. I'm not going to dig into it in much more detail. If you're interested, it's on GitHub. However, the main thing I'm trying to get at here is that you can't just write an Arduino sketch, say, oh yeah, plug this module and talk to it, and get me the signals. Because you need to know the frequency, the bit rate, the frequency deviation, and then you also need to know the sync word, and then you also need to know the rest of the format of the message. So which bytes are the ID of the switch? Which bytes contain whether it's a press or release? Which bytes contain a checksum, if there are any? So how do we determine this? So to figure out these parameters, we can't really just use a receiver like this, because this needs configured with predefined parameters to actually receive a signal. So if you're trying to use this to try and reverse engineer this, you'd basically just have to guess these parameters and keep guessing different values until it worked, and that's not going to be easy. So instead, we're going to be using one of these. And this is called an SDR, or Software Defined Radio. It's something I've been into for quite a while. It was one of those you know, hobbies that I spent far too much money on and then never had time to do it. But these are software-defined radios, and if you haven't heard of them before, essentially what they are is an analog-to-digital converter for radio spectrum. It's a bit of a weird concept to get, get your head around, but think of it like a sound card, like a microphone input on a computer. All that does is take a wide range of frequencies, different audio frequencies, and capture them. And it'll capture all frequencies in a huge range of audio frequencies. This does the same, but with radio spectrum. Inside an SDR like this, you have a tuner that tunes to a specific radio frequency and then an analog to digital converter that takes that radio spectrum data and digitizes it. And they all have different bandwidths. So this particular model here is a fairly entry level one and has a frequency range up to about 1.75 gigahertz. Can't remember quite how low it goes. And has a bandwidth of around about three megahertz. So this means that if you tuned it to around about say 100 megahertz, you'd receive radio spectrum data of all signals from I think 98.5 megahertz 
all the way up to 101.5 megahertz. So you get that slice of radio spectrum. And it doesn't do any sort of signal decoding. All it does is give you that raw data into the computer. So when it comes to signal decoding, all that's done in software, which gives you great flexibility. This particular SDR here is known as an RTL SDR. I'll put a, put a link to this one in the description. RTL basically means it's got a real tech RTL 28 something something chip in it. And these are often sold as TV tuners. Now this one here is actually sold as an SDR, but the cheapest way to do this is to buy a lot of cheap USB TV tuner dongles because those use SDRs. Because it, it turns out it's much cheaper rather than trying to make all the TV and free view decoding hardware in a physical device, instead, just capture that radio spectrum data into a computer and make the computer do all the decoding. So as TV tuners are not very good and they're you know, pretty resource intensive, but you can use them as SDRs. And while it sounds like this sort of hardware will be really expensive, it's really not. I mean, this one here is quite a nice one. It's got a nice SMA connector on it. It's designed as an SDR. It's got higher end components than the cheap TV tuners. This one only costs about 35 pounds or something. And the cheap TV tuner ones, which would be absolutely fine for this job, you know, you can get them for probably about a fiver if you bought them from AliExpress. They're really cheap devices. Now, of course, you can get nicer ones. For example, here's a Hacker F1. This is a much higher end one. This costs a good couple of hundred, but this can go all the way up to six gigahertz and has a 20 megahertz bandwidth. So with this device, you could literally capture, say, the entire FM radio broadcast band all at once and then go in afterwards and tune to different stations from the recording. This is a much higher end device though, and it also can transmit. So you definitely don't need that for this kind of thing. It's much more, much higher end, but they go all the way up to this. I mean, they go even more expensive than this. But all you really need for this is a basic SDR that can do 433 megahertz, which this one definitely can. So all I needed to do was use specialized software with this SDR to capture all the radio spectrum around about 433 megahertz, click the switches and see what signals we received. So let's take a look at that. Okay, so before we go into the signal decoding side of things, I'll just show the SDR working. I keep meaning to demonstrate this and do a full video on SDRs. I mean, it's been on my list of videos to do since I started doing YouTube, really, but I've just never got around to it. So I'll do a quick demonstration here. So the SDR is currently set up with the antenna hanging out the window because it's flat space at a Faraday cage. And I've tuned to the FM broadcast band. So you can see here at the top, we have 101 megahertz. And at the bottom, we've covered it, covered it by that, but we've probably got about 98 megahertz or something like that. And as you can see, that's a three megahertz slice. And then in here, you've got frequency going along this axis, time going down this axis, and the intensity of the color represents the intensity of the signal at that frequency. So here, there's a lot of background noise, a lot of random bits, and just, there's always noise you'll always see. But then this big strong thing down the middle is a radio station, that's BBC Radio 1. If you scroll through, you'll see other stations. So that's another station there, that's Heart. And you can actually see, depending on the shape of this, sometimes you can see if it's playing music or if it's voice, you'll see that in a minute. So I think that's probably I don't know if that's voice or anything, I'm not going to click it because I don't want to get a content match. But that's hard, I think they're called now. Whatever, the keep, radio station keep changing names. Come further up here, it's the other stations. If we come up here, you'll see there is... Well, that's accidentally saved, I need to remove that. That's Capital FM. And what you'll interestingly see here, this probably only makes sense to people in Scotland, is in Scotland, at least Central Belt, Capital Edinburgh is 105.7 megahertz. Capital Glasgow is 106.1. And you can actually see that here. At 105.7 in Edinburgh, that's capital Edinburgh signal. That's the capital Glasgow signal, which as you can see, is much weaker. So you can actually see all, you can basically literally see the radio signals. Now, I'll, I won't use those because they're all playing music and that'll get content matched. But if I go down here to the more boring radio stations, you find the ones that are talking. And you can actually spot the speech. You'll see it's a different pattern. Those ones up there are playing music. It's a much less full line when it's speech. And if you click on that, you'll hear the radio signal. That's the radio station being decoded. And then even worse, in March of 1328, they had to come to go down here, you'll find a different radio station. So I move that frequency down. There's another one there. That's playing music, but I think it's classical, it's hopefully fine. So yeah, that's it working. So I can just go in here, pick a radio station, click it, and it'll tune to it. And you can actually view all the signal strengths, you can view the stations, it's really, really cool. But essentially, because all I'm doing is capturing raw radio spectrum data and all the decoding is handled by software, I'm fully flexible with what I can do. You can see up here is different, different decoding you can use. So there's FM, FM stereo, all that kind of stuff. There's also nothing stopping me recording this entire radio spectrum coming in later and then tuning into stations and decoding it. 
it's really, really flexible. So that's a quick demonstration of how the SDR works in a more easy to sort of conceptualize thing like FM radio. So let's take a look at how it works with these. So when it comes to these kinetic switches, what I've done here is I've now tuned to around about 433 MHz. So now if I click one of these, you'll actually see the radio signal come in. And that's coming from this button. Like if I press the other one, that'll also come in. If I hold it, you'll see one for press, the other one for the, re for the release of it. And you can even see other signals coming in here. So that's another signal over there on 433 MHz. This is a, stand, a shared frequency range that lots of devices and sensors and stuff will use. So this will be to pick up all sorts of devices from all around about. This will be things like key fobs, alarm systems, weather sensors, all that sort of stuff. In fact, I was playing about with other software called RTL433 that can receive all different things from an SDR like this at this kind of frequency range. And I was just randomly playing with it and saw a signal coming in from a car's tyre pressure sensor that must be parked outside. And it just randomly told me a random car's tyre pressure because it just receives all these signals. So it's all well and good seeing it in this software here that kind of lets you get a rough idea, but we really need a bit more detail. We need to be able to see the exact parameters of the signal, not just a little blip on the screen like that, because this sort of software like Cubic SDR is really more designed for listening to radio stations, not really so much for actually investigating signals. So now to decode these, we're going to use a different piece of software called Universal Radio Hacker. And this is much more designed for decoding and reverse engineering digital protocols. So if you think back to the code that we looked at earlier, one of the first things we need is the, is the center frequency and the frequency deviation. So how far the frequency shifts up and down when it's doing the FSK modulation. So to do that, we're going to use Universal Radio Hacker and we're going to use the Spectrum Analyzer feature. So we're going to look at all frequencies around about 433 MHz because it'll be somewhere in there because we know that from the data sheet. And we're going to capture full 3.2 MHz bandwidth. So we're going to start that there. We'll see some signals coming in. So we're going to click the button and see what happens. And there we go. We can now see that we've got a signal and you can see it appear a little blip there. If you click it again, you'll see it shows up. And it keeps the peaks here so you can see what you're looking at. So if we look at the centre here, the very centre peak is 433.3 megahertz basically. Right around there. And then you can see the other ends of this spike here will be where the frequency is shifting up and down. So you can see that the top here is about 433.35 megahertz and the bottom is 433.25 megahertz. So that means that the frequency deviation is 50 kilohertz. And you'll notice in the code, that's exactly what I have here. So that's what I've already determined and I've put those values in. So through the spectrum analyzer, we've determined the carrier frequency and the frequency deviation. But what we now need is the bit rate and also more information about how the signal's built, such as how we can get the sync word as well. So now the next step is to actually investigate more of the digital protocol, figure out how the FSK works and the actual parts of the message. So to do that, we're going to use the record signal feature and record the signals from these to a file that we can then analyse. So I've already set some parameters here that I found work best. So I'm going to record with one megahertz, a one megahertz sample rate. You need to record at quite a high sample rate because the message from this is actually transmitted quite quickly. And then we're going to record a 200 kilohertz bandwidth. The values you put here don't really matter, but you might need to play a bit on the next page to get the signal. But again, this isn't really a whole tutorial, it's just really what I did. So we're going to record the signal, it'll start recording, and I'll press both buttons like that. See, the MK one's a lot weaker, but I suppose that's just closer to the antenna. So now if we save that, and then we can close this, and it'll pull up the file for analysis. And here we go. So what you now see here is the whole, is all the signals. So you can see there's the press from the MK, the release from the MK, the press from the paddle, and the release from the paddle. And if we zoom, in, zoom into these, you'll see what it's transmitting. So what you'll see is it's transmitting three times, or four times, but towards the end the signal starts getting weaker. So it trans transmits sort of two fairly clear looking pulses, and then the power starts to run out, and it drains off to basically nothing. So you can see that's kind of the signal there, and that's what it looks like. Now of course the image isn't that useful, but what then happens is if you highlight this, it will then show you down the bottom the binary that that relates to. So you can see here what you get is you get a bunch of ones, you then get this repeating 10101010 pattern that goes on for quite a while. That seems to be like it's starting up initialising, and then you start to see some data. Now in this interface it's not very easy to see, plus with the screen resolution bigger so you can see it easier, it's a bit hard because of text wrapping. So what we'll do is we'll jump over to some binary that I've extracted previously from when I was initially de developing this, and I've broken up the message 
so we can see what it's made of. So there's one more thing I forgot to do before we go and start looking at these binary strings, and that is the one parameter of the signal that we still need to figure out, and that is the bit rate. So obviously it's defined here, but how do we figure that out? Well, you would do that from this interface here. So if we zoom in here, you can see we have a signal, and if we highlight parts of the signal, you'll see it highlights ones and zeros, and likewise we highlight the ones and zeros, it highlights part of the signal. And what it also does is it shows how many microseconds it took to send that amount of data. So if we highlight one byte here, or one bit, sorry, you'll see that it says it, take, it took nine microseconds. If we highlight two, it says 19 microseconds, three is 30 microseconds, four is 39 microseconds, and so on. And if we go up to say highlighting 10 bytes, or 10 bits, it says it took 99 microseconds. So it's maybe a little bit margin of error there, but it's basically looking like it's taking about 10 microseconds to send each bit, give or take one microsecond. So if you do the calculation on that, 10 microseconds send a bit, that gives a, sum, that gives a bit rate of 100 kilobits a second. And that's what we've defined there. So that's how you find out the bit rate. So finally, we now need to take a look at those binary strings and work out how we can extract the data that we need from them. So I've already taken them into, the, into VS code here and I've separated them into different actions. So we've got the paddle being pressed and released and then the MK switch being pressed and released. And I've already added some spaces in to break them up but I'll show you how I roughly figured out how to break it up. So with VS Code, when you highlight a bit of text, it then highlights all other instances of the same bit text in the file, which is actually really useful for this. It's quite hard to see, it's quite a faint grey, but you can just about make it out here, it's highlighted then. So if I highlight the first part of each message, you'll see it's the same across all the messages, with a slight exception of the number of ones at the start. They slightly align differently, but they all contain the exact same preamble, which is repeating ones and zeros, and then eventually some actual data. Doing the same further along the string, you eventually get to a point that you'll find a bunch of bytes where they match for the same switch, but are different between the switches. So you can see I've highlighted this here. Of course, this is all bytes you're going along with in eight characters blocks. These 16 characters here are the same on all instances of the paddle switch, but different from the MK. And if I look at the same 16 bits on the MK, you'll see it's the same for all the MK stuff, but not the paddle. So here, this looks like the switch identifier. And in fact, if we take the ones and zeros from the paddle, and then copy that into a website that will convert hex, convert binary to hex, you'll see we get 2E0A, which coincidentally, if you look at the bottom of the switch, starts with 2E0A. So we found the switch identifier, which is very useful. In fact, I can't quite remember what I did when I was figuring this out. It was all a bit all over the place. I do think at one point I actually did convert 2E0A into binary, then search the file for, two e for that binary string, and that's how I kind of found the origin of where the switch ID was. So yep, we've now found the switch ID. Next up, all we really need is to know whether it's been pressed or released. So if you take a look at the next byte after that, you'll see it's not quite the same on them all. So you can see that when I release, it's always one one and then a bunch of zeros. And that's the same for both the paddle switch and the MK. However, when I press the switch on the paddle, it's a bunch of zeros, one zero zero, but on the MK, it's a bunch of zeros with a one. So they're different for pre the press button action is different between the paddle and the MK switch. However, if you look more closely, you'll notice that the first bit of this is zero when the, when the button's released or pressed, and one when the button's released. And you can see that is the same on the MK and the paddle switch. I also tested a bunch of other Quintic switches I have, and all of them, the first bit of the byte that comes after the ID represents, seems to represent it being pressed and released, with a zero representing a press and a one representing a release. So that's all I did in my code. All I do here is I just bit shift and get the first bit of that byte, and I use that to determine if it's a press or a release. The other stuff here, I don't know what that means, but I'm just living in blissful ignorance and not thinking about it. So yeah, we now know the switch ID and how to determine if it's been pressed or released. So we're almost there. All we need now is we need to get a sync word that this device will be using to look for that, where it'll look for that sync word and return all the bytes that come after it. Now, obviously we've established that this whole string here is the same for them all. So we could really use any amount of this as a sync word. However, this particular chip here only allows sync words that are up to two bytes long. So all we're gonna do is take the two bytes that come before the switch ID. 
So I'm going to take a look at this and take 16 bits there, that's two bytes, copy that, once again, convert that into hex, there we get A423. So if you remember the code from earlier, that's what I use as my sync word. We go up here to where I configure the radio and you can see the sync word is A423. So what now happens is when the radio receives that sync word, it returns the bytes that come after it, which will be where the first two bytes will be the switch ID, the next byte will be the byte that contains the bit that represents whether it's pressed or released. So there we go. We've now figured out all the radio parameters that we need. We've also figured out the sync word, and we've worked out from the data that we receive how to get the switch ID and whether it's been pressed or released. So from that, I could basically implement everything. There was then one other observation I found that someone else had mentioned when the, the person that did the same thing with kinetic switches just using a different radio module. They mentioned that obviously there's a lot more bytes after this. And from a reliability perspective, it would make sense that they put some sort of checksum in it to make sure that the message is valid. Because I first of all implemented this all, you know, just from my own investigation without any of the checksumming. And it worked. But you would sometimes find that you would press the switch and because it transmits multiple times, you'd get the correct press through, say, twice. But then as it's starting to run out of power, you'd maybe get another message through where it would kind of be the same, but like the switch ID would have a bit flipped it'd be a little bit different. Or you'd get a lot of noise, just random little bits that happened, random bits of noise that happened to contain the sync word, and you'd get the data from it. So it makes sense to have some sort of checksum. So first of all, you'd probably assume they're going to be using a CRC checksum. It's the standard way you would do it with something like this. And we're going to assume that we're going to do the checksum using the switch ID and the byte after, so these three bytes. So we're going to take those and we're going to convert them into hex. So we're going to use that website we are using from before. There we go. Take the space out there, convert to hex, we have 2E0804. So that's the message. And we're now going to use this website here, crccalc.com, which the other blog post recommended. Really, really useful website. I'm going to definitely keep this to remember it. Where we paste in the byte, paste in the hex decimal. Make sure you pick hex here because when you leave that on ASCII, which it defaults to, it won't work and it'll confuse you. And we're going to calculate a CRC16 checksum. And as you can see, it outputs different CRC checksum values for all different algorithms. And all you now need to really do is look at all these, look at your binary here, and see if you can find any of these showing up in here. You can also get it to output the checksum that actually adds binary as well. And all you really need to do is just look through and see if you can find a CRC checksum in this data. And you can actually find it immediately after the byte that contains the switch press state. So the next two bytes here are actually the checksum. So if we take a look at this binary string here, put it into the binary to hex converter, that gives 2384 in hex, which if we do the checksum of that message, you can see we look down here, we have 2384. And we can try the exact same thing for the MK to make sure. So we'll take this message here, we'll do a release just for fun. So we'll take that there, convert that to hex, which gives E4B8C0. We do a CRC16 of that. We're going to take a look at the value for the same algorithm, which is CCITT, which gives a result of 2315. If we take what we think is a checksum here and convert that to hex, 2315. It's the same. So with that, we've now figured out how to get the checksum. So this means that when we receive a message, what we can then do is take the three bytes here, create a CRC16 CCITT checksum of it, and compare that to the fourth and fifth bytes here. And if it matches, we know it's a valid message. So I've implemented that, that in my code as well. So I've used the library um, ACRC, seems really good. It supports all different CRC algorithms, including the CCITT one that we identified. So we've got that there. And then all we now do is when we receive the message, before we go anywhere into actually processing it or looking at it, what we do is we calculate a CRC of it and we check it matches. And then we only continue processing the message if it matches. And if it doesn't match, it'll just output a little message saying CRC mismatch. And with that in place, it works. And I only receive switch press states for the actual correct switch IDs. And I, don't, I no longer get any, any of those spur spurious ones where the switch ID was maybe a little bit different. I will only receive the correct messages now. And with that, I've now got a working solution. So 
that was kind of how I determined all the radio parameters and looked at how you, you can get into the protocol. And then outside of that, it was just a lot of Arduino bodgery from someone who's forgotten how to do Arduino bodgery. And I was able to make this work. So yep, that's the solution now all working. And I think I mentioned it earlier, I'm using the IoT webconf library, which gives a nice web interface to set up things like the Wi-Fi connection details, the MQTT connection details, and this is running from the ESP itself. So I can go to this web page, it's got a password on it that can, it starts off the default password that you can then change, and I can set it up to connect to Wi-Fi. So actually, if I wanted to make more of these, all I would need to do is build the hardware, flash the firmware, and when you turn it on for the first time, it broadcasts an SSID with a password on it, you log into that, it then pulls up this configuration page that lets you set it up to connect to a network, and it'll then work. And then you can use this wire, or connect one that the GPI open, which is set up as um, D2, connect that to ground, and that will reset the device and make it start up in access point mode again to set up the new Wi-Fi details. So there you go, that's the solution I've come up with there. So if I click that, light comes on, drop the switch, click it again, light goes off. It's fully functional. So that's a very quick run through of the code and how I've determined how I've determined all the values. Probably very rambly, but hopefully you kind of got the idea. And obviously the code's on GitHub, so if you want to kind of adapt this and figure it out, I've put links in the description. I suppose all that's left to do now is turn this into a slightly more user-friendly enclosure and, oh god, that wire's falling out, great, and yeah, have it so the wires don't fall out and disconnect an SPI line while it's running and, well, get it installed and actually install some kinetic kinetic switches and get them hooked up to my lights. So obviously I'll go away and do that off camera and I'll come back and show the finished solution. Okay, so I've now gone away and built it into this little enclosure. We'll take a look at it in a minute and see inside it. It's not the best. I very much made it up as I went along and realised I really need to plan things better rather than just start shoving things in and hoping they fit. But we've got it all in here now, so we've got a sort of little, little enclosure. So the antenna just screws on to the SMA connector on the end there. It sticks out, so that's quite neat. And then there's a USB C the USB, the micro USB port on the bottom for power. Just cut a big hole out, it's fine. It does the job. And a reset button on top and a status LED. So, if we plug it into power, so this is literally just a power connection, there's no computer on the end of this now. This just goes to USB power supply. Plug that in there. You'll see the light will start to flash. That's indicating it's connecting to Wi-Fi. This is all done by the IoT WebConf library. And then in a second it'll come on solid. And it'll stay on solid and just occasionally flash to show that it's active. And that's it now connected to Wi-Fi. So now that it's like that, if I press the switch, it works. So that's working, no computer. Just powered up over USB power. And then just quickly demonstrate the USB, or not the USB, the reset switch, just in case it's interesting to people. Obviously this is right now connected to Wi-Fi. If I disconnect the power, hold in the reset button, and then plug it into power, which I should probably try and get in position, there we go. Hold in the, power, hold in the reset switch, and then press put it in, like that. Let it all come on flashing, and it'll just come on flashing continuously like that. What this is now doing is broadcasting an SSID called Kinetic to MQTT, and with that password, it's the default password on the back, it's just hard-coded in the code, it's easier, easy enough to do. So now if I connect that SSID with that password, and then attempt to go to a web page, it'll grab the captive portal and give me a configuration page to let me set the Wi-Fi settings on it. And then obviously if I unplug that and plug it back in again, it'll boot up normally, because even though I labelled it reset, it's not quite reset, it just forces it into configuration mode. It will, it will still, because I haven't changed the settings, it'll still connect back to Wi-Fi normally. So that's on there again. And it'll work. So I think finally all I need to do is get this installed out the way in the living room, which will be dead easy to do. And then get my initial Sonoff minis that I'm currently using as light switches, where I've got Sonoff minis connected to retractive switches, take them out and replace them with kinetic modules. Although one last thing before I do that, Let's just pop this up and see what's inside. So, just in this little case here, it doesn't actually screw together, it just clips together so we can easily enough open it up. Is that there? And then we just carefully leave the case open. There we go. That opens up like that. And we can see inside the case what we've got. So, we've got the radio module over here as before, but rather than all those random wires, I've now got a ribbon cable and it's connecting up this prototyping board that I've put on top of the we must do one mini, and that handles all the connections. So we can start taking it apart. So if we undo these two screws that are holding in the radio module. So this is screwed in, the Wemos is just hot glued in. 
I'd hoped to use similar screw mounting posts for the microcontroller. However, I hadn't really judged the height properly and there wasn't enough space to actually get proper screw posts underneath the microcontroller. It would become too tall and this would hit the top case. So I've got these mounting posts hot glued in there and the microcontroller itself is just hot glued in, but that's fine. So now I've got this ribbon cable that connects onto the radio module so that can easily be unplugged. And then on top of the microcontroller, we can see we've got the prototyping board. And if we pop that out, that just unplugs neatly. There's the microcontroller on its own there. Here's the prototyping board, so that connects on top. And that breaks out to the ribbon cable. All this does is just has those blue wires just connect the various wires out of the ribbon cable onto the appropriate pins on the microcontroller. And then we've got the reset button, which just goes between D2, I think, which is one of the general digital inputs on the microcontroller, goes between that and ground. And the LED just goes between another GPIO pin and, and then the other end on ground via a 100 ohm resistor. So dead easy. So that's just a dead simple thing there. Easy enough to put together. It's a shame I had to hot glue microcontroller in. I'd have rather not done that, but oh well, just didn't really judge the space. I think next time I should try and use a bigger case. I think I tried to get away with the case that was a little bit too small. But yeah, that was going there. So I just need to screw that board down, get it put back together, and then get this all installed. Okay, so here I am in the living room and they're ready to install the Quinetic switch module. So as I showed in the previous video, I currently have these retractive switch modules that control my lights. So the room's got smart bulbs in it and that switch is a momentary action switch that's wired into a Sonoff Mini in behind here. The Sonoff Mini is just connected to the retractive switch as well as the main supply. So when I press the switch, it sends an MQTT message to Node Red, which controls the lights. It's dead simple. And then the Sonoff Mini is just running Tasmota. So all I need to do now is pop this open, take out the Sonoff Mini and the retractor switch, which will clear out an absolute ton of space in the back box. Because the one, my one complaint with this is it's, the back box are full of stuff because the Sonoff's quite big. So take all that out and stick the Quinetic switch grid module in instead. Okay, so I've got this all open here. If you want more information about this, I've got a dedicated video on it. But as you can see, we have the Sonoff Mini there with the main supply wired into it. And then these two white wires come out and go into the retractor switch. So all we need to do now is get rid of all this take out the grid module and put the kinetic module in. So there we go, that's all removed, so it's a lot neater, so that's the, all the stuff I've taken out there. And now all we have in there is just what you have at a standard light switch now, which is much easier. I was also able to take out a couple of Wagos because I had to have a five-way Wago to common all the neutrals together. And then because there were so many switched lives, I ended up having them going into a five-way Wago as well, whereas now I've got them coming out the back of the switch directly, so that is a lot neater. So what you do is get this back to the wall and get the kinetic module in. Okay, so that's all now screwed back to the wall. Yes, I know it's powered on, there's a big gaping hole in it. I'm not an idiot, I'm not going to stick my fingers in it. Actually, I am an idiot, but I'm still not going to stick my fingers in it. Then for the receiver, what I've done is I've already got a boot case with an LED strip in it, and that's powered from a multi-port USB power supply sitting on top of it. So all I've done is plug the receiver into that USB power supply as well, and head it on top of the boot case out of the way. So the final step is to get the Kinetic module in. So I've got a new Kinetic module in here that I've labelled up to the ID just so I can access it. And if I press that, it'll control the lights, just like that. So all we need to do now is clip that into the grid frame, like that, take the front plate, stick it on, and now I have exactly what I had before, except it's now using a kinetic switch. So yeah, that works absolutely perfectly. So there you go. That was a look at building a custom receiver for kinetic wireless switches. And this was a super interesting project. I learned an absolute ton about reverse engineering radio signals, and in the, in the end, it's given me quite a useful little item I can use. I can now have as many kinetic switches as I want, and have them easily control my smart home system through Node-RED and Home Assistant. So yeah, super happy with this. So yeah, hopefully people found that interesting. It was definitely a bit of an in-depth project, and I probably rambled a lot through the technical side of things because I was just trying to get it out there quickly. But if, the, if you're looking to do something like this, Hopefully this gives you an idea of what you need to do. And I have put a link in the description to the code. So hopefully you can find that potentially useful, although it's not fully tested. I've not really run it for any length of time, so I don't know about its long-term stability, but it does seem to work for me. So yeah, hopefully you found that interesting. And all that's left to say is thank you very much for watching.